What's up, fellas? Time is your most precious resource. And the principle that we're gonna kick off today's video with is easily the most underrated concept for getting more jacked, saving time, and then also getting in good shape as well. That's not the great white buffalo either, despite what most people think. You can have all of those things at once. Now, some returning viewers might be expecting to hear me mention giant sets and supersets. While those are a great way of achieving all those things that we just mentioned, those aren't underrated concepts. Most people know about those. If you don't, giant sets are you do three exercises back to back to save time and increase conditioning and supersets is the same thing except for you do two. Everybody knows about that. What I'm talking about is something that I call cluster sets. Now to give credit where credit is due, I got this from Josh Bryant. Josh Bryant, for those that don't know, is a world-class strength and conditioning coach working with the likes of Julius Maddox, Shane Hunt, Death Grip Derek for you Instagram enjoyers, uh, Tom Haviland, that huge English dude that goes viral all the time for just being a complete freaking house. This method that I got from him, cluster sets, essentially boils down like this. You take a weight that you would normally do like 10 to 12 reps with on a good day, and instead you do sets of five with it. Now the way that you do it is important. That might sound easy to some people. I assure you that it's not, right? So you take that 10 rep weight, you do sets of five with it instead. Give yourself 10, no more than 15 seconds rest, and then you do another set of five, and so on and so on. I like to do this for up to seven minutes. You can get in so much work in five to seven minutes of almost continuous work that the amount of volume that is different between just doing three sets of 12 and this is at two to three times at a minimum. It is not uncommon for folks to get 75 to 100 reps. Now here's how you do it and you make it fun. You get a song that is between five, seven minutes long if it's an instrumental one. The angrier, the better. The more hype, the better. And you just go to work. Now if you're feeling nasty and especially jacked and stacked, you can do super cluster sets, which is something like biceps, triceps, super setting, following that cluster set protocol. So meaning you do like three cable curls, three rope push downs, rest 10 seconds, and repeat that for five to seven minutes. You will get so much work and have the most earth shattering pump that I assure you, this is something that you are going to include in your training programming regularly, if not year long. Now fellas, this in my mind goes without saying, but I'm gonna go ahead and caution people. Do not do compound movements and try to attempt cluster sets with them in this fashion. It is not safe. You're more than likely gonna tire. Form will degenerate. You snap yourself up. Don't do deadlift cluster sets. Don't do bench press cluster sets. The idea with this is to take a movement where you are targeting the muscle specifically and not generally like with a compound movement, but more so you wanna pick movements where if you're form deteriorates a little bit, it won't increase your injury risk. Now for those that are looking for a good place to start after that warning message, I like cable curls, reverse curls, tricep rope pushdowns, leg extensions, and upright rows. Those are the ones that I most commonly prescribe in that cluster set. But now that we're finished with the quick tips, what I want you guys to do now is just tell me a few isolation exercises that you enjoy, bro. I'll be able to tell you, and I'll reply to all your comments, which exercises lend themselves to cluster sets, and then how to use your favorite exercises in a cluster set. Let me know in the comments down below. So with my Q&A videos, I like to do quick tips and then hot takes. Hot takes are always a big discussion piece. I love them. This time's hot take is gonna be extremely divisive. I already know it. So let me know what y'all think before I give my input, but here's the hot take. Cutting weight is only necessary if you have health complications or if you want less fat, he goes on to say 18 to 25% body fat is the optimal muscle building range and that that doesn't look as flabby as social media makes it out to be. Again, let me know what you think. I agree with the first part, obviously, you should only be cutting if you need to. I say that all the time, I'll say it till the cows come home. If the question is if you should bolt, the answer is yes. 18 to 25% body fat is not the range that you wanna do that in. You wanna do it the leanest that you can. For me, that's sub 10% body fat, for a lot of y'all, that might be around 13% body fat on average. Also, that's gonna look every bit as flabby as you think it does, and as social media says it will, unless you have an extreme amount of muscle mass, unless you're someone like natural hypertrophy, Jeffrey, uh, Alex, myself, you're going to look 
soft at 25% body fat. Your abs aren't gonna show, no veins, no muscles whatsoever because the majority of people that watch content don't have a highly developed body. That's just the truth of it. The most of us are just looking to get jacked and stacked for the first time in our lives. So I don't agree with it whatsoever. I think this one is a stinker hot take, but I think it's an excellent discussion piece as well because people are gonna have opposite opinions. You fellas, let me know how you feel about that one. We're gonna get into the first question. This is an excellent question. This is for the calisthenics and row enthusiasts, actually. What is the real difference between a vertical pull and a horizontal pull? The main difference, in my opinion, isn't uh, vertical pulls are for width and horizontal pulls are for thickness. That is semi sausage head logic. What muscles get worked in a pull has to come down to the angle that your elbows come into when you're at that squeeze portion of the movement, right? So if you're out here, that's like upper back and rear delts. If you're close to your rib cage, it's lats. You can do that on either a row or a pull. So that's not the difference. The biggest difference in my opinion is what your shoulders are doing, right? So the level of abduction or adduction and what angle that comes from. That's a lot of giga brain stuff to say, look, when you're doing vertical pulls, your shoulder's doing this, it's going up and down. When you're doing horizontal pulls, you're going back and forth. That has implications with your shoulder health. I made a video a while ago called Ball Chad Shoulder Health Lecture, talking about how basically, when I didn't do overhead pressing motions, even in just my warm up, I noticed that my shoulders started to hurt. And then once I started including that, my shoulders felt better. The opposite is obviously true for the antagonist opposite muscle group, right? So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're doing some form of vertical pulling, some form of horizontal pulling, just to make sure that you maintain full mobility in your shoulders, stability in your shoulders, and also just not punch yourself a one-way ticket to Snap City. That's the main difference in my opinion, not necessarily the muscle groups that are biased. All right, fellas, this next one is an opinion that someone wanted my opinion on, but they say that frequency and volume don't matter for hypertrophy, only progressive overload matters. Bro, what you just basically said to me was is that progressive overload doesn't matter, progressive overload is what matters. In my mind, I have the understanding that you believe that adding weight is the only means of progressive overload. There are lots of ways to progressively overload and induce hypertrophy. That's getting in more frequency, doing something more often, doing more reps, volume, or getting in more reps in less time, which is density. You can even repeat the exact same workout that you did like twice and get a small hypertrophy response the second time you do it. Then there's also adding weight. There's five different ways you can get more jacked. Disqualifying four of those ways is why people do not get jacked. Here's the thing, bro. If you try to even just add a, a pound each time to your weight training session, there's going to be a limit to that before you need to do something else. Or we would all be Ronnie Coleman. We would all be Kiriakos Grizzly. We would all bench press a thousand pounds. That's not the case. There's other ways that you have to go about doing this. Adding weight is probably the last thing that you should be trying to do after exhausting all of those things. So for this next piece, it was actually a request. I prepared a whiteboard drawing for you. We're gonna head back inside and talk about our next piece there. All right, we're back inside, fellas. The gentleman asked, a simple resume of your best exercises for each muscle group would be amazing. I don't have the time in this Q&A to go over the why in this video of all these exercises. I'm gonna put in a pinned comment for each of these exercises why I like them at length. We're gonna start with the beach muscles. We've got the chest, shoulders, back, and abs. Of course, you see that our boy guts is dominating over half the whiteboard, so I can't put them all on here at once. So we're just gonna jump cut you know, between muscle groups. Starting with the chest and shoulders, I really like camber bench, weighted push-ups, Larson press. Those are my big three. I'm the prince of all Larson presses. Of course, those have to be included. These two, the camber bench and the weighted push-ups give you a good stretch that you just don't get with other movements. Now for upright rows and loo raises, as well as the power raise, if you're keen to see my exact reasoning at length, I just made shoulders the final answer. Check that video out. Now for back, again, Seal rows. I am known for doing them. I prescribe them all the time. You have done them more than likely because you saw me doing them. Pull downs. These days I'm liking over pull ups, at least weighted pull ups. I really like the full range of motion Franco Colombo pull up. But the reason why I prefer pull downs these days is because you can manipulate the angle at which you pull a little bit better. More at length in the pinned comment. 
deadlift variations, you have to do some sort of deadlift variation for back. I don't care if it's conventional, Romanian deadlift, stiff leg deadlift, trap or something. Deadlift related, you have to do for the back. Then for lat prayers, this is the lat isolation that I think a lot of people are lacking in their programs. More on that in the comment. Now for abs, I don't feel as though you need a whole ton. I do weighted leg raises and I do weighted sit-ups. My core is extremely developed, it's extremely thick, dense, and muscular. We're gonna skip to the legs now. All right, next up, first for the quads, we got heel elevated squats. I like using the SSB, but you can use a high bar or a front squat stance on that as well. That's gonna give you a good forward knee angle, get you a lot of stretch on the quads. Single leg press to get that rectus femoris action going. Pause squats, you get more or less weight, you develop more strength. It spares your knees because you're not bouncing off of them at the bottom. Now for hamstrings, nothing compares to Romanian deadlifts. I got Tom Platts on the brain, but nothing compares to Romanian deadlifts for getting that stretch hypertrophy for your hamstrings. Also really good for the lower back as well. Ham curls are gonna give you that full robust development because you're not working every head of your hamstring with just stretch based movements. You get most of it, but hamstrings will really finish her off. Now for adductors, wide squats should be the foundation. You should be doing that at a minimum. Now, again, to really finish it off and give you that full development, once I started including the adductor machine, my squat training, my deadlift training skyrocketed. My adductors ballooned in size. I'm much stronger for it. All right, to finish her off, we're gonna cover the low back plus glutes, calves, and then arms. Now for low back plus glutes, and I put those together because typically you're just gonna work the two together no matter what you do. Back extensions are my favorite. They give a good stretch on the glutes, specifically the 45 degree version. I like doing them somewhat weightlifting style, but with an SSB just because I find it's easier on the shoulders. I've fallen in love with SSB Good Mornings lately, bro. I'm not gonna lie to you. I used to rag on them a lot, but I watched the Dan Green video. I was able to make them work for me. And there's something that I find myself prescribing for people a lot lately. Last but not least is, you know, like a sleeper exercise. Not every gym is gonna have one of these, but that booty builder hip thrust machine, the strength curve on it is immaculate. You can throw bands on it to give you a nice change in resistance curve. You don't need a ton of weight on this compared to a barbell one, and it just feels really good. Now for calves, I think that standing calf raise with a good stretch at the bottom is gonna be your bread and butter. In my opinion, you don't need a ton. I've been doing this lately, and I was a calf day skipper for a long time, but I really enjoy it. It's very difficult. You can push the sets to you know a high threshold of failure. And then for the arms, I'm just gonna go through biceps, triceps, and forearms, you know, all together. I feel to an extent just doing deadlifts and rows is gonna build certain parts of your forearm, but I've been really liking the reverse curl for cluster sets for forearms lately. Cable curls give me the best stretch and contraction. Also for a lot of people, I find that they're just, you know, easier on the elbows than like something like a barbell curl. And then last but not least, rope pushdowns for the triceps. I prescribe these all the time. Like I said inside, I'm gonna have a pinned comment talking about each of those movements, how I use them, why I use them, more at length than we talked about there. I really just wanted to show off the drawing and you know put those movements out there. It's a whole video topic that I could make in of itself and it just wasn't the right time to go at length because we have other things to get to. The next question is actually another opinion Trap bar deadlifts are the best deadlift for the average person. Fellas, do you want to be average or do you want to be jacked and stacked? That's my opinion on it. Now, there is nuance to it. So as a personal trainer or a strength and conditioning coach, if you're working with someone that has never deadlifted before, trap bar deadlifts are a good tool of teaching people how to strain off the floor and teaching them intensity. But even just teaching them a proper hip hinging pattern or trying to learn one yourself a trap bar deadlift is neither a hip hinge nor a squat. It's like halfway between both of them. So you're not really learning either, right? So you're not gonna become an ATG squatter like uh, Lu Zhaojun or freaking Toshiki Yamamoto by doing trap bar deadlifts. And you're not going to do stiff leg deadlifts like Dr. Mike by doing trap bar deadlifts. Where I find that their main use is, is outside of that you know, you know, generic complete beginner capacity, 
You can use it as a tool with the low handles to get in a little bit of extra pulling volume if you find that your low back can't recover from a lot of deadlifting volume. But there's the piece there. You use it in addition to deadlifts. You don't use it instead of deadlifts. It's not something like a stiff leg or an RDL where in they are complete hip hinges, you can use them to replace deadlifts as a hypertrophy exercise for your posterior chain. You can do that. Dr. Mike does it. I did it for a long time. Tons of bodybuilders have been doing it for dozens of years. You don't see folks doing the same thing with the trap bar deadlift for a good reason because it is simply not as robust of an exercise. Moreover, for the strength enthusiasts, the big movers, we all have the big mover mindset, a lot of us do anyway. You will find that a big trap bar deadlifter is worse at deadlifting than a big deadlifter is at trap bar deadlifts. That better makes sense. So one is gonna give better transference to the other. There's just a lot of things that contributed to not being the best overall holistic exercise, in my opinion. Next question, second to last question. This is gonna be a juicy one for our calisthenics enjoyers. Very relatable to a lot of y'all, I'm sure. That's why I picked it. What should I do if my pull-ups are stalled between five and eight reps and my chin-ups are increasing? So this fella is doing weighted chin-ups and he can't even do 10 uh, pull-ups. There is a big reason why I think that's happening. It's, it comes down to the grips that people typically take when they do pull-ups, which are inherently wider, work a little bit more upper back, and chin-ups are obviously more lats if you take like a closer grip. That tells me that your upper back musculature is lagging compared to your arms, compared to your lats. The easiest area of opportunity here is, is if you find that you can't go beyond five and eight reps, use like a dumbbell row, for example, or a barbell row, where you have the ability to work in a less intense range and get in more volume. Dumbbell rows are probably my favorite. You could even do something like a lat pull down where you're using that wider grip if you're at home. You could even do something like a, like a snatch grip barbell row, again, for a higher rep range. So you could even go 12, 15 reps. If you're a seal row enjoyer, like myself, you can even do seal rows for that same purpose, but you're gonna wanna bring up that upper back musculature. All right, fellas, last question until next time. This is always a lot of fun. I love interacting with y'all with these Q and A's. You already know, BQ, Raider Captain of the Noble Natius, High Professor of Delt Destruction, gets the last question on these Q&As because he always gives good insight that is applicable to the rest of y'all. So he's having a situation where, with his bench specifically, he has been stalled at like between six and seven reps at 275 on bench press, but he finds that his back down sets are progressing. He wants to know what should he do to get that top set moving again? To me, this is something that I was just talking about with my buddy Sam about you know his bench press training and what he's doing right now to you know kind of mitigate the same problem what you find is with strength training even if you're working in a higher rep range so you know like bq is he's working between five and eight reps on his top set he's not doing he's not even doing one rep maxes on it right now or doubles and triples or whatever you need to build up a certain amount of volume before you can unlock that next threshold right so for singles it's intuitive we find that okay if we want to go from a 315 bench to a 350 bench, we need to add like between 30, 40 pounds to our working sets of 10. We get the three sets of 10, and then that's an indicator that we're ready for, you know, a 350 bench, right? The same thing applies if your top sets are with reps, but it's even more of a necessity for you to increase both performance and weight, but also the total number of reps. For you to go from, you know, a top set of you know, 275 for six to 275 for 10, that's like going from a 315 bench press to like a 340 bench press. We don't think that because it's for reps. So what you need to do, bro, is very simple. Something like a step loading protocol. I got this from Alex Bromley. It's essentially what Sam's doing right now. It's what I want you to do here. You should take either, you, you got one or two ways you can think about it, bro. You could do more sub-maximal sets with 275 and just focus on increasing total reps with 275 and increasing in weight once you reach a certain threshold. Or you could take the weight that you're doing with the back offs and just do that same thing, right? So for your 240 or 245 is what I think BQ is doing specifically. You could aim to do like three sets of 12 with that and then increase weight 
and then you'll be able to more than likely add a rep to your 275. What you need to do is build up volume to work up to that higher top set. Now, if you wanted to do 275, I don't know if you wanna do this because you'll have to work with like sets of honestly three. I know you don't wanna do that, but what you could do if you wanted to, you could work with sets of three or four and then build up to like maybe, you know, four sets of four and then you add a little bit of weight, but you're not trying to do that. You're trying to get the pump. You're trying to get in more volume. So I would go with the 245 route. Once you get to like between four sets and five sets of like 10 to 12, you'll know that you're ready to add a bunch of reps to your 275 because your overall, you know, work capacity, your overall volume tolerance, the amount of muscle that you've built by doing that will be indicative of you being able to do so. That was this week's Q&A, or not this week, we do it like every two, three weeks. I'm sorry, guys, I have to rename that playlist. This was a lot of fun. If you have any questions about these questions, please let me know down below. If you have any questions for next time, please also leave those here and on the most recent video or community post that I make, I'll be sure to consider them for these videos. Y'all have a good one.